Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the My Vinyasa Practice podcast, Heartfelt Consciousness. I'm so thankful you're here. This week, we have MVP's Sue Goodley with us. Sue, how are you today? I'm doing well, Michaela. How are you? I am so excited that you're here. I'm so excited about today's topic. We're going to be talking about inclusivity in yoga and what the journey to the self can look like for all types of people. When you think of inclusivity in yoga, Sue, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Um, actually, I had to look it up. I'm like, what does inclusivity actually mean? So I'm like, let me go back to the definition. And it was very interesting for me to read that, you know, it's the practice of equal access to opportunities for all. And regardless of physical or mental disabilities, um, or belonging to my minority group. So I put that um, in a framework of yoga. And I'm like, it was very interesting because of course that's what we try to do. But I was looking at the physical disability side and thought for some yoga teachers, that might mean someone overweight, someone older, you know, it can mean so many different things, but it was just interesting. I know for me, it means whoever shows up, I got to find a way to teach them. <laughs> and um, it's a challenge sometimes. And, you know, it's just, we all, life is yoga. We all need yoga. Um, it just means so many things. It's such an open-ended question for me. And even as the teacher in the class, I know that sometimes students will come to a local class that I teach and it's a vinyasa class, you know, and it, it kind of goes both ways because they see me as the teacher like well, she can't do, vin you know, can't do vinyasa. So I have to really let them see that yoga is forever. And they learn, they learn like she doesn't have to do something to cue us into it, but just all ages, all sizes, all colors. I think you made a good point that underlying like life is yoga everyone who's alive is a yogi and is a practicing yogi whether or not they know it um and it's really interesting that you bring up physical disability because last week we talked with Steffi a little bit about her club foot and what that what that's like for her because it can kind of be invisible to people who don't know what they're looking at or what they're looking for um and so it's interesting to hear your take versus Steffi's take. Mm, yes. What do you feel is the most challenging for you as far as feeling as though people view you as someone who doesn't vinyasa? That's probably a lot of my own material as well. I didn't say that to start, but I know that's a lot of my own. The challenge is to, it's a challenge every time the class is like, and then I am like, okay, I hope only, I do it. I'm like, I hope only older ladies show up for Vanessa today and no muscle looking people, you know. Muscle looking but, people. <laughs> I hope that, you know, it's people that, I'm comfortable with. So a lot of that is my own material, but the biggest challenge is just the first few poses and just, you know, I'm not going to sit there and say, Hey, I know how I look, but maybe that would be a good strategy. Like, I know I look like, maybe I should start with that. That would be real, you know, but, um, you'll have a good class anyhow, because you can just read people's faces sometimes and it's, um, but they come back and it's okay. But they come back and it's okay. I love that. So I have similar experiences because I also live in a bigger body. Um, and sometimes I feel as though people are surprised to see me. Um, and I feel like I agree with you. It's the first few moments of class that are the hardest because yeah, it probably is our material, but I don't know. It, it's hard. It's hard to balance. Um, but that same feeling is kind of what I use you know, I don't want my students to ever feel that way. Right. Exactly. That's what informs my teaching a hundred percent. Like I don't want anyone to come into my 
not even my, the yoga class and yeah, feel like they don't belong or they shouldn't come back or because someone comes to class, they registered or they walked in for a yoga class. They need yoga. They've realized they've even begun that journey of self-realization that they need something and you don't want to leave them with a bad taste in their mouth for the practice or, you know, make them think it's not for them. And that's our lineage, right? I remember reading in Heart of Yoga, Desika Char talking about his father, talking about Krishnamacharya and like my dad's yoga was all about meeting students where they are. And this is not a, you know, this is, there's history to this, you know, and it's just really good to be part of that lineage. And just starting, I remember there was a sentence in there about starting from where the student is. That's inclusivity, you know. Oh, that gave me chills. Starting from where the student is. Yes. I love that. Oh, that gave me chills. See, I'm serious. It's um, from more of you. Yeah, I mean, that's just text that I remember because, yeah starting from where they are and that could be with anything that could be with breath work you know if it's someone brand new you don't want to introduce them maybe to breath of fire right away someone did that to me and I got real nauseous yeah yeah and I'm yeah it's not some you know just they maybe have never thought about their inhale and their exhale that's a perfect place to start that's a great point they may not have even realized that they can be aware of their breath I did control it. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember that. And, um, as being one of the first things that drew me in, it was like, wow, I can think about my breath. You know, it's just all these little realizations that just continue, continue, continue to build up, but just wherever they are with breath work, with sitting, you know, how many times do we say, let's start in an easy seat And then you look in the class and like, oh, these, let's not start with the easy seat. You know, let's take our legs out long because of where they are. Just things that we need to, um, to just remember. I mean, first of all, who am I to share yoga? Like the whole thing is, you know, it's so powerful that it's, you know, you want to honor the ancient practice. You don't want to do anything to it, to make it less than what it is. And really, all it is, is getting to know yourself. So just providing that space for students to, you know, spend time. You bring up a thought for me, because I feel like sometimes when I look at inclusivity, especially as someone who is really passionate about adaptive yoga, I get to this point where I'm like, well, it's kind of feels redundant because shouldn't yoga be adaptive? Isn't all yoga adaptive? Shouldn't everyone be included? So it it kind of feels like, kind of feels redundant, but then I remind myself as a white person of privilege that this is not the reality for everyone. Of course it should be that way, but not, that's not everyone's lived experience. Right. And um, yeah. And we want to, I don't know, I lost my train of thought, but my gosh, yeah. Because even where you go to yoga or we go, even if it's in the park, there's a majority where I live, you know, it's white ladies, girls, very even few men around here, but, you know, not to, you want other people to come in. You know, my children are interracial. My husband's black and I've seen so much of their struggle in life and just how they have been marginalized and just so many things. And it's like, I'm not sure why I, I never really realized my privilege until I was raising my children, I guess I should say. Like I knew that I loved all people. It didn't matter to me, but I'm, I still have lived with privilege white privilege is still, yes, that's, I grew up with that. And it's just amazing to see some of the things that they've been excluded from based on the color of their skin, like, or just even, I remember when my daughter would go like to middle school, I mean, when she started middle school, 
And then people automatically thought she wasn't smart. Like it's just because of her color, just, you know, ridiculous things like that. But I can't even imagine what it feels like for some of these people who are brave enough to make it to the yoga class and knowing that they're not the norm, but they, they make it into the room. Just that, what they had to go through to get there. I mean, they, they want it, they need it. It's calling to them, you know, it's just really important that we give them a sense of community, togetherness. Another word for inclusivity um, is completeness. So the opposite of that would be incomplete, you know, and you don't definitely don't want to leave anybody feeling incomplete. I love that. No, even if they step into the space feeling like they're incomplete. Yeah. We want them to leave the space knowing that they are complete. Absolutely. That's a, yeah. Wow. A lot of things have co are coming up for me. Um, it's hard. And I feel like I get caught in the spot of, am I doing enough? Am I, am I holding space clean enough? Am I projecting? Do you get that feeling in class sometimes? Yes, and I probably do those things in class sometimes. I probably do project. Um, and it's about forgiving ourselves as well, or maybe coming clean with that. Like, um, I'll just admit like, okay, that probably wasn't scripture or yoga text. I probably just, you know, put it, in my own context and I shouldn't do that. I know that I do it, but I think that coming clean with students, even as it's happening, just, and Michelle has taught me this so much watching her classes and when she teaches and she'll just wait, pause, restate something, restart. I'm like, that's such a beautiful way to teach, you know, just to let us see like, okay, maybe this is a thought that was in my mind, but let me redo it without even saying anything. She just pauses and redoes it and it's like, that's a beautiful thing, but I'm sure that I do. I know that, and then teaching online, I don't even know some of the people. I know their names well and their little boxes because I know they come back to class, but it's important to, to always come back to where you think the student might be. And that's, that is hard, but just let them, it doesn't have to be hard, I guess. If we just provide a space for them to sit with their body and breathe, that's all they need. It doesn't have to be hard. I feel like I make it harder on myself. Um, so inclusive yoga, that comes in like so many different forms, right? For me, what immediately comes up is body type. And you said something that reminded me. So I had my first full class of men at MVP. That scared me. Yes, it was very intimidating. I, I'm obviously not a man. I don't know what it's like to have smaller hips. I don't know what it's like to carry my muscle on top of my fat. I don't know what it's like to have more broad shoulders. You know, I don't, I don't know. And I have this material around it and so I was so happy I celebrated yes I have four men in my class all men this is wonderful I can't wait and then I was immediately like oh I don't know how I don't know how to do this but then it was okay it was okay because I came back to the teaching just like you said Michelle in my ear reminding me be authentic be you and that's enough Right, right. Yeah, it's, um, and it's important to have, maybe it's not important. We're very fortunate to have a great teacher that, you know, we have all of these teachings and so much more than just the asana. And not that, I'm, I mean, I'm a fan of asana, you know, in yoga. That made me like being in the body I have right now. You know, that gave me that, that, that power to, to like, hey, this is my body. Now, when I have putting myself out there, like, I don't know, on a video or a podcast or 
photos and I'm, I actually see myself, it's like, oh gosh, but all the other time I feel fine. I feel great. I'm happy. I don't really concern, you know, it gave me an avenue to realize that you don't have to be unhappy where you are in your, you know, in your body, because that's not what society tells us at all. You know, it tells us like, I'm going to be 50 in a couple of weeks. I'm kind of like, what? what? 50. But it tells us that we shouldn't, you know, we should try to fight aging. We should always look a certain way. We should, I don't know, identify a certain way, just all the things. And that's just not, we're such complex people. It's okay to age. It's, it's a blessing to have lived this long, you know, and it's okay if my skin isn't quite as plump as it used to be, you know, it's okay if there's those lines, it's, it's part of the journey and people need to feel that as well. Women struggle a lot with that. Like if they come into my yoga class, it's more like, oh, I'm old. Or they start talking about this wrinkle or this gray hair or this or that. And I'm like, it's fine. You're, you know, you're beautiful. You look okay. Look at what your body can do. Look at what your body can do because they, you know, they are doing all of these poses. They're matching their breath. I don't know what I'm saying anymore. It's just, it's just about self-acceptance and yoga gives you that. And that really lends to kind of the whole idea of inclusivity because there was never any point in time when yoga decided that it was exclusive and only a certain amount of people and a certain path of their enlightenment can practice it. When we practice inclusive yoga, we are practicing what we believe in that it's not ours to give, right? Everyone already has it within them. We're just guiding people towards their own enlightenment, showing them that they can. Absolutely. That's yes. It's just a guide. Yeah. Um, and I just really, really want everyone to have it. <laughs> so I guess that's an attachment of mine that I need to work on as well. But it's like, I just want everyone to know they can find peace within themselves and it can be a beautiful place to rest. I think that's why a lot of us decide to become yoga teachers right? Because I, well, for me anyway, I hit a low point in my life and yoga was my saving grace. I guess I should say yoga showed me that I was my own saving grace and that I didn't need to rely on anything outside of myself. Um, and so I think a lot of us come to it wanting to share that healing, that relief of suffering with our students. Absolutely. And you do a great job with that, Michaela. Your classes are phenomenal every time. I love picking your classes. Oh, Sue, I feel the same way about you. I think you're magnificent. And our students love you. I was talking to oh. someone else the other day about you and she, I don't remember her name. Oh, I'm so sorry, student, if you're listening. She talked about how your just your presence, how comforting and open and welcome she felt oh that's so sweet to hear thank you student as well yes thank you if I think of her name I'll tell you yeah that's that's really sweet and beautiful I mean because all of this is not like I can't even believe when I think about it that I even taught a live stream class I'm like that's never gonna happen but <laughs> yoga just gives you that like, you know, refocusing with you. There's so many things in the last eight years that I've done that I hadn't done my entire life. And it's because of yoga. And just like, okay, I have the skills. I have the practice. I have the tools. I'm going to take some deep breaths. And then I'll do whatever it is that thing might be that I never could do. Like, I would never drive out of state. Like, that was a big fear of mine. Like, I'm not going to drive somewhere. I'll go, but I need someone to drive me. Um, started doing yoga. I took a 10 hour road trip on my own. Like, you know, just things like that. It's so empowering to do the things and to get those old paths out your head. All the stuff the world has tacked on to us, just experience, samskaras, right? Just to 
to just get rid of that and actually build new paths and know that it's okay to change. There's nothing wrong with that. People change, you know, humans change and that's okay. We're absolutely, we're constantly in a state of flux. And I think that that's what vinyasa kind of holds space for. It puts us in the practice of noticing when something changes, what happened? How did your experience change? And then the realization that you did that, that came from inside of you. Um, Which is part of the reason why I love vinyasa because it helps me. Like you said, I love asana. I love it because it allows space for me to touch the more subtle parts of myself. Yes, it's a practice. Absolutely. Or just to, yes. Um, I know that a lot of people say it's more than asana or maybe asana has been getting a bad rap or something in some of some avenues of the community, but I always defend it. And maybe I'm the last person who would, think would defend it, but that's how I came to peace with myself. You know, connecting the breath, the body, just making all those connections so you can go deeper in. It helps bring you in, absolutely. And what a nice mind break. If you're linking breath to movement, you're not thinking about anything else, but okay, they told me to send my hips up on the exhale, because, you know, and it's just, it just becomes a beautiful, I don't, to me, it's, I know a lot of people refer to like Shavasana as like a meditation or prayer time, but to me, the whole practice is, it's just so meditative. I like to practice with my eyes closed, you know, um, I like to have to open them sometimes too. Maybe there's a new asana that's so that I've never done before, you know, and you just double check to make sure you're going that right direction because you're like, oh, I can't do that. Or maybe I can. So just all comes back to being inclusive with yourself as well, I guess. Yes, because the journey to the self is inclusive for everyone. And that's something that you said when I originally asked you to come onto the podcast um, and ask what you might want to talk about. And you said, yoga is a journey to the self. And I've just, that's been sitting in my heart space for a little while. And honestly, I think that's what makes yoga inclusive. That is the journey to the self. Absolutely. I like that. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. And of course, I'm in this Tantra training now, which that's a journey to the cell, deep, deep, but it's just more practices to, and it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know, and I'm so honored to be part of that training, but it it kind of puts a name to a lot of things that, you know, you felt, and then just to realize this is ancient wisdom. This has always been true, you know, and it's just even more stuff you want to share, but you have to pull back on some of it, I suppose. I feel like I could talk about yoga forever and ever and ever. (laughs) Holding back is not my strong suit. It's not my strong suit. No, but you can't teach a yin class and just learn about all these bondas and try to throw it in there. That's not right. It's not smart. Mm -mm, Doesn't work. No, no. (laughs) Too complex. Um, I love that. I think that the whole practicing with your eyes closed really, really lends to the fact that it's a moving meditation, not a workout. I've been hearing a lot from people in my life who aren't deep within the practice like I am. Of course, they're yogis. They're in their own practice because they're choosing not to practice. They're choosing not to do all of these things, right? Um, So they're in the practice. But I get a lot of, uh, I don't want, uh, I don't want to work up a sweat or I'm going because I want to work up a sweat. And it's one or the other. And then I'm like, but it's not about that. You could lay on your back the whole time. Or you could do a high plank the full 60 minutes. Oh my goodness. (laughs) You could. You could do whatever you want. And so choosing to arrive, that's important. Yes, absolutely. I can't even think about a 60 minute plank though. (laughs) but you know and I had students that 
and I always say that as we all do, you can do anything you want to do. You don't have to, um, you know, do the poses I say, it's only suggestions. We tell this to them all the time. And it's very important that we say that, of course, but I've had students who took me up on it before and it's like, okay, and it's fine. But at first, even that is a little alarming, you know, like, okay, they're literally doing their own practice. But at the same time, it's so beautiful that they just wanted to share the energy with other people in the room and showed up and did their own thing. And I'm like, that's accessible, inclusive yoga right there. Because there's nothing wrong if that person can pop in a headstand. You know, we, it has to go both ways. You know, that, yes, that's important. That is important. And at MVP, I think we do such a, such a, such a good job of adapting for less sensation and more support that a few times our students have been like, well, what about us on the other side who want to take it further? Which I think is a beautiful reminder because you're right. It has to go both ways. It has to go both ways. Otherwise we're not being inclusive anymore and we're passing right. judgment. And, and I do, you, yeah, we have to be careful. I do that. I had like, I taught a chair class. It didn't work out locally. So it went away. Um, because what, for whatever reason, the people I was targeting weren't coming. You know, I wanted people who, who needed chair yoga. And then ugh, these people would come in, these super fit people would come into my chair yoga. And immediate, like, why are they here? Now, you know, what do they, what do they want from me? But um, it was fine. We did chair yoga. They just wanted to breathe, you know, but I have to be careful with that because I'm like, you're not who I wanted to come to my chair class. I wanted people you know, senior people or people with recovering from, you know, I wanted people who needed to sit down and that's not what I was getting. So I had to adapt my practice to teach them and get them into their bodies and do a little bit more. But I have to carefully watch that because I like to be challenged. You know, you want people to get better physically as well. Not just, it's not just self-realization. Let's take advantage. We're moving. Let's move in a way that's healthy for our bodies. It's going to help us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. It can be hard though. It can be hard when you have expectations for what your class is going to look like. And then the universe has a funny way of giving you what it thinks you need. Yes. And voila, you must try something new. Um, I think that's beautiful though. Just being able to hold that space. That's what it means to be an adaptive yoga teacher, an inclusive yoga teacher, is being able to meet your students exactly as they are. So you might not have wanted people who maybe looked like they were very physically fit to come in, but hello, the universe said, yes, you will have them. Right. It did. <laughs> And I made it through and it was okay. You did. And um, I bet you grew from it as much as the students grew from it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Just totally know that we should never go in with expectations, but sometimes we do, but labels are fluid. Labels are fluid. Labels are fluid. It helps me too when I feel like it's frustrating that not everyone sees yoga as we do that this is a thousand, more than a thousand year long practice that has been done in a million and a half different ways by billions of people. Who am I to be bothered by what someone else is doing? Right, good, that's good, that's really good. It's hard though, because I feel like at MVP, we do a good job, I feel like we're creating ripples in the yoga community, because our students come to us, they get all of this newfound knowledge. Yes, yoga is for everybody. It doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter if you use props, whatever. And then they go to these other places, and they're like, "Oh, but wait, I want to use my blocks in my vinyasa class, but they're not offering me blocks. I'm going to use them anyway because I know I can." Right. And we're making the little waves. Yes, and given, and then maybe the teacher or the other students in that class see that and think, okay. This is a great idea. 
I have to be careful when I go to classes sometimes not to go get blocks for people if I'm not the teacher. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to just not. But you see them struggle in something and you're like, oh my gosh, if you just had two more inches under your hand, you would be strong, you would be stable, you would get all the benefits of the pose instead of, because that's what it is, that's what the props do. They just give you the right alignment so that you have that stability and ease to feel the energy moving in your body. But if you're struggling or out, you know, just trying to get your hand as low to the floor, but many teachers don't correct that, you know, and it's like, you just think, oh my gosh, you would be loving this pose so much right now. <laughs> you just had two more inches, yes. but maybe the teacher isn't aware either, but. Right, right. We can only do better when we know better. And if they don't use props in their practice, then it can be hard to right. incorporate it into their teaching. But I feel like that's, that's why it's important to continue, like you said, to take other classes and to try different things because that's how we build our arsenal to be able to hold space for people who don't have the same lived experience as us. Right. And it's, yes, it's absolutely because I needed props that I know how to use them, you know, mm -hmm. and had a teacher who, who always said they were available, but didn't necessarily cue me how to use them, but she would bring them to me. So I would start using them. You know, <laughs> Just let you figure it out. It out. <laughs> yeah. Like she brought them to me. She knew they would help me, but you know, so it's good to experiment with, with your own body. But like you said, if it's not something that you need, and it could just be the length of your arms, you know, it doesn't yeah. have to be just how we or how your femur head fits in your hips. Like it could just be little things. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't know them. Like I had a student come in a beginner class the other day and <clears throat> literally, so we're in tabletop and moving into Anjane Asana, just bringing the foot through She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, okay, here we go. Like, I need to check myself and I need to go back in and really start understanding that some people, you know, the proprioception is, you know, you have to start there. Where am I in space and time? So that was hard for me to cue. So I really had to check myself. I'm like, I don't know how to tell her besides what I'm saying, how to get her foot there. You know, it's like, yeah. I couldn't think about no, you know, I just, I couldn't remember. So basically I just showed her, but, you know, just taking little things like that for granted. I mean, she saw where it needed to go, but she's like, well, how do you bring it there? And yeah. she had to come, you know, she came out of tabletop and then like, yeah, it was something I'm still working on it because that was like, Ooh, I don't know what to tell her. So that stuck with me that I need to go back to some basics myself. We never stop learning. We never stop learning. Um, I feel like I've said the word adaptive several times, like 3,000 times in this podcast, but the fact that we are always learning means we have to be adaptive. We have to stay adaptive. We're always changing, like you said, so we have to stay adaptive. Right. We do. I just... I just wish I could have every single person in the whole world come and do yoga. I just want everyone to feel the peace, the release, the surrender, the connection that I found in yoga. 100%. And I hope that no one ever sees me and thinks I can't come into that class. I can't come into that studio. I'm not welcome here. No. Me either. No, that would be, yeah, I, I don't want that to happen. And I will continually to work and change and improve my teaching and, you know, just continue to try to uplift the entire collective. And I think that, you know, I love what my vinyasa practice is doing. All these yoga teachers out there, just think how many more people are getting to know the practice. You know, I just love that online environment and equality training all came together and that people are actually being prepared and wanting to share and feeling good about themselves and feel good feeling good about sharing it it's just it's exciting to think that it's you know reaching more and more people and talk about inclusive that's an example of inclusivity right there um 
the online offering, we literally have students all over the world of all walks of life, all socioeconomic status. I feel like working at MVP has really held space for me on my journey to be an inclusive human, not even just a teacher, an inclusive human. I agree. Yes. Just definitely all the people that we get to meet and the community. And it's just like, and then just feeling so at home with them, you know, just having an office hours or being in a lecture that someone's leading and, you know, you just like feel like even through Zoom, I've made so many friends that I've never met, but just sat with people that are like-minded and just immediately find comfort with. It's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. We have the best community, um, I think. I'm super thankful to be here. <laughs> Me too. All right, Sue, do you have any final thoughts or feelings you would like to share concerning inclusive yoga, yoga is the journey to the self, self-love, anything at all? Love yourself. If it doesn't feel like love in your yoga class, don't do it. Um, yoga was created just for you. What a beautiful way to end our session together. Thank you everyone for joining Sue and I today. I hope that you had a great time and we will see you next week.